Happy politics and welcome to week 7,000 of the pandemic. Uh, this is your favorite BC political podcast. My name is McLean Kay. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Orca and I'm joined in a very socially distant manner by... Jordan Bateman, VP Communications, the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association. McLean, you sound about as excited about all this as, as I feel. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, we're all just kind of exhausted and weary more than anything else. I mean, I, I can't even suffer, uh, summon enough uh, energy for outrage. We are, yeah. we are taping this on Groundhog Day, and I feel like we are <laughs> eternally locked in Groundhog Day, the movie, living the same pandemic over and over and over and over and over right. and over and over and over <laughs> and over again. Yes. Welcome to yeah. the cheerfulest, uh, the cheeriest uh, BC Poly hot stove of all time. Yes, and for the uh, for the half of you that are still with us after that <laughs> wonderful introduction, and the first thing we're going to talk about, of course, is the pandemic. <sighs> well, let's talk about vaccine supply because that is the yeah. issue right now. Uh, it should be the light at the end of the tunnel, but the last couple of weeks have been rough. Um, Pfizer had uh, issues with a factory upgrade uh, in Belgium and uh, needed to delay its um, commitments to, for shipments to Canada. We actually received a grand total of zero uh, last week from yeah. Pfizer. Hopefully that's being cleared up, but now... The EU is threatening uh, tight export restrictions on, well, all vaccinations. They're, they're under intense political pressure to vaccinate everyone at home first, which you can understand. The problem this creates is for people like us, um, Canada, which has no vaccine um, capacity at all domestically. Uh, we might sometime in September, assuming construction in Quebec proceeds on schedule. Ah. I'll just, just well, pause that what, linger for a moment in the air. <laughs> what can go wrong? Yes, a work of sublime fiction, Quebec construction uh, schedules. And uh... well, the minister, the funny thing is, like the prime minister was saying, uh, sometime maybe they'll be ready sometime this summer. And the minister responsible was like, I would say late Q4. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you got a better chance of making a Greek ferry uh, on schedule than you do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's. Wow. Sorry, you're a Greek ferry aficionado, uh, famously legendary for its uh, schedules just being a, ah, yeah, they run the way whatever, they run. Uh, it's, like when you redesign anyway. a website. it's like when you redesign a website, you always got to budget twice the amount of money and twice the time that you think it should take. Yeah. yeah. So this has created problems in the provinces, which have had to uh, readjust their vaccine plans on the fly um, through no fault of their own. Uh, there were reports this week that Saskatchewan essentially is a ground to a halt. Uh, mm -hmm. Alberta as well. BC, apparently it's not quite that bad, but still, uh, we are already deep behind the planned schedule. And uh, for people who are going to be at the end of the list anyway to be vaccinated, like uh, I'm assuming you and, and definitely me, man. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's pull this apart a little bit here. First of all, uh, on the Orca.ca, Rob Shaw uh, makes the case for Premier John Horgan to get the uh, jab. Uh, okay, but no Prime Minister gets the jab until we actually have enough for everyone, uh, since he's the one who could control it. Uh, more seriously, though, um, in Rob's piece, he mentions that Dr. Bonnie got her first shot on December 22nd. Well, by my count, we are at nine days after that in December, 31. Uh, plus 31 in January, that's 40. Plus today is February 2nd, today is day 42. She should have had her second booster two weeks ago. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. But she's been stretching it out to 42 days. So today is the day where she should be getting her second shot. If she does not, did we just waste the first shot? And I'm not just picking on Dr. Henry, but everyone who got it in that yeah. December period. Um, uh, the, you know, Dr. Bonnie played the long game here and assume that, um, you know, <laughs> trusted the federal government to provide, uh, which is always an error. Um, the federal government has never met a giant program. They didn't screw up. Um, ask the uh, gun register, ask the $100 million gun registry that cost billions. Ask the uh, Phoenix pay system. Uh, this is the problem with, um, like, you know, McLean, I have a, a slight libertarian streak. It's not as uh, thick as some people would think. Mm -hmm. um, but built in that is a healthy distrust of government. And they are, you know, especially the feds, are certainly proving <laughs> to not be worthy uh, of that trust. You know, here we are, um, it's February. Uh, it's going to be, seems like a couple more weeks before we get any more vaccine. Um, they're, you know, out there patting themselves on the back for, you know, bringing a factory that may or may not open by Christmas. Um, hopefully we're all vaccinated by them. 
Um, where was that a year ago? Like, why weren't they building out something a year ago for this? Why is it that this government can get off the hook after bad-mouthing Big Pharma for years and after, you know, successive governments put in policies that basically drove pharma, uh, pharma uh, out of Canada? Um, we should be holding them to account. Like, here they are. You know, they've got the cure and, you know, we're last in line. Yeah. I'm sorry, Prime I, I, I don't buy the Prime Minister's idea that, you know, oh, he's talked to the EU, it's all fine, you know, it really won't affect Canada. That's nonsense. You know, you know that's like him, uh, he always comes in after the fact on these things, right? Like Keystone Pipeline, Kevin's, well, I'm going to talk to him on Friday. Well, Biden canceled it on Tuesday, so uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, oh, well, the, uh, you know, they're fine, the Transfer Act isn't going to apply to Canada. Well, we're not part of the EU, so how do you figure it's not going to apply to us, bud? These are the things that are starting to wrap me up. Yeah, I mean, and I, the problem is, is that any of these things in isolation, it, I mean, there is nothing Ottawa can do. If if the EU decides to screw over the rest of the world until, you know, every last man, woman, and child in Italy, Slovakia, and France is vaccinated, yeah, we're caught with our pants down. The problem is, as you say, the fact that we have no capacity here and we are, you know, subject to the whims of other countries, and that's a problem. And, you know, once in a while, Canada has to kind of remind itself that, you know, we're a nation of 38 million people that's, you know, the size of a state. And you know, <laughs> we are going to be back of the line uh, when push comes to shove in a lot of these things. And so, you know, not having capacity at home, well, it creates problems like this. This seemed so predictable. You know, 10 months ago, they should have been on it, creating, you know, the environment to, to get some of these um, vaccines made here. And they didn't. And now we're going to pay the price. Like, you know, you start to build out the candle here. I think you can forget about um, any fun on spring break, obviously. I think, you know, the summer is oh, going to be yeah. a little bit like last year's, hopefully, where the but restrictions get relaxed. But with these variants running around, maybe not. Um, you know, forget another grad year. Like, those grads get screwed over uh, for a second straight year. Um, you know, are kids going back to residency at universities in September? Uh, probably not. Um, you know, are we finally out of this by Christmas? M maybe, but not if the is holy. Like, this is incredibly depressing. Um, and it traces back to government hasn't done a good enough job. And, like, you know, I, I'm of the mind now that, you know, this nonsense about spring election, spring federal election, that has to be, that has to have fallen by the wayside. There is no way they can go because... You know, it's funny. So I, I listen to two other political podcasts regularly at issue to get that mm -hmm. uh, Ottawa bubble feel um, and to hear the uh, nonpartisan <laughs> Rosie Barton. Sorry, I couldn't even bring myself to say it. It was a tweet this week. Anyways, um, anyways, uh, at issue. And I listen to uh, the strategists out of Alberta. And it is interesting to see last week's episodes. They had two very different views as to how this vaccine the bubble in Ottawa, uh, specifically uh, an incredible writer, Chantal Hébert, uh, basically defending the Trudeau government, not a big deal, they're on it, you know, they're gonna get it, 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 this will evaporate, it doesn't affect their plans for a, a, a May or spring election. And then the strategists in, in Alberta saying, whoa, you know, and they're generally favorable to the Trudeau government, whoa, whoa, hold up, like, you know, everyone's talking about this issue. This is hitting everyday Canadians where they live. Everyone's upset and pissed off about this. They have got to do a better job. Forget a, a spring election. So who's right? The bubble or, you know, the last two federal liberals in Alberta? Not really <laughs> sure. I, 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 from where I sit, you know, I lean more to, you know, to the strategists. Like, I, I feel it. I'm sorry, Chantal. Like, I, I don't think you understand or are talking to enough folks, like, how desperately... Um, fatigued, exhausted, uh, mentally broken um, society is becoming over this. Like it's, it's big, it's, it's rough. And the vaccines were a glimmer of hope. And, you know, like the little carrot on a string has seems to have been pulled away here at the last second. And if you I mean, if people are frustrated now and they are, and they should be, um, and they have every right to be because we're all exhausted. But that said, 
if we get to a place in a couple of months where the United States, as terribly as they've handled this pandemic, yes. but they're going to be leaps and bounds ahead of us on overall vaccination in a couple, they're already leaps and bounds yeah. ahead of us, but in a couple months, when they're you know really getting to the point where they can really see the light at the end of the tunnel and we're still kind of stuck in neutral, yeah, that's gonna get that's gonna provoke some very uncomfortable uh, discussions. Um, I, I don't know that it's gonna be about blame. It's gonna be you know how did we get here and you know, why are we so far behind? Uh, it'll be about blame. And look, there's no <laughs> Donald Trump anymore to buffer Trudeau. That's true. One of the most important things in politics is to come in either after or alongside someone who is incredibly incompetent. Um, you know, because when you come in after someone who's incompetent, you look great by comparison. If you come alongside apples and oranges, uh, you look great. Uh, think Sam Sullivan and Diane Watts, they both got elected as mayor's first term, uh, one in Vancouver, one in Surrey. Diane was considered a star by the media and Sullivan was a one-term mayor. That is a perfect example. So there is no Donald Trump anymore. Like Justin Trudeau can't hide behind this thing uh, and can't climb behind the monster and say, well, well, this guy's you know, screwed it up even worse than me. You know, it, we're already, I think, America's at five times uh, higher percentage of uh, folks vaccinated than we are. We're still counting the first doses. They're actually counting real, like, vaccinations, like you've had two and you're done. Uh, Israel is up uh, over half. Mm. This, is it the Seychelles? Is that how you pronounce the that? Seychelles. The Seychelles. <laughs> Sorry, I never go anywhere. Um, the Seychelles, <laughs> uh, they're at 25% vaccinated. How is the Seychelles at 25% vaccinated and Canada is at 2%? It doesn't make any sense. So, you know, we can't, like, you know, we've gotten a lot, the governments have gotten a lot away, gotten a lot away with a lot by comparing themselves to America and the uh, dumpster fire there. But uh, the dumpster fire has been by and large put out. We're starting to see some flaws in how they actually handle things. Uh, I'm thinking of Cuomo and um, in New York, and it's not, not all it cracked up to be. But the big orange monster is gone, and now Trudeau will have to be uh, held to account for his own actions. Well, man, can you imagine in a couple months if if things continue on this path? And they, they may improve. I want to, I mean, to be fair, there are three vaccines that have not yet been approved by Health Canada. And if that happens, hopefully things will start speeding up. That said, we're not there yet. And we're still going to be, you know, not first in line. That, but can you imagine in a couple months when, you know, the U.S. is ahead and, and people start having really uncomfortable conversations about, you know, they're offering it for a, for a price in Seattle, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. because they have excess supply. When does that start becoming a conversation people start having in a serious way? You uh, know, like yeah. if you could just pop over and, you know, jump on a flight and, and self-isolate for two weeks, is that is that worth not waiting a few months. If you do it legally and above board and not lying like the couple that flew up to the Yukon, but just, you know, if they're, if they are selling it and offering it in the US, I'm not suggesting people do this. I'm saying this is going to be a conversation that starts being had. Well, the Seychelles seems to have some sort of supply. So let's say they get everyone vaccinated. And they're like, great, we're opening all of our resorts. You fly here, <laughs> spend two weeks here in our resorts. We'll vaccinate you on day one and day 14. That is going to be a very popular uh, Sunwing destination. Let me tell you. <laughs> yes. um, here's the other. Here, here's the other concern, and let's talk about science. The science says that we need to get as many v people vaccinated as quickly as possible in order to prevent future variants. Um, mm -hmm. And now we've already seen uh, several variants from different regions. Uh, some of those now are mutating a second time. Um, <clears throat> this is a um, virus that wants to survive and mutates to do it. So by slowing down our vaccination process, we're actually going to limit the effectiveness of that vaccine because this virus will be allowed to mutate. And you know, there's gonna come a mutation at some point here that the vaccination isn't as um, you know, potent against. Um, this is a big concern and another reason why we should be sprinting as, to do as much as possible. Shame on Justin Trudeau for le leading Canadians to believe that he had this all under control. You know, we had 80 million doses for 30 million Canadians. We were all going to be set. We'll all be vaccinated by summer, blah, blah, blah. Shame on him for that. He clearly misled uh, Canadians. Uh, as you pull this sweater that's unraveling very quickly and you're seeing the emperor really has no clothes on this issue. Um, you know, he's, <laughs> he's going to let us down here. Like, he already is. And, you know, one only hopes that it's almost like, hoping for some magical God in the machine type 
savior to come riding in, you know, Sansa's army in the Battle of the Bastards or something. Like, you need something to come and <laughs> save us. Um, and uh, I just don't see where it is. Do you know what the real nightmare scenario is? Is mm. in a few months, uh, when places like the U.S. are ahead of us in vaccines, is people start talking about the Canada variant. Oh, yes, that will be great. I, well, let's right? just... Like, not only would it be terrifying, but, like, on a humiliation level, yeah. that's, wow. Let's call it the Toronto variant. <laughs> just to be... Just, well, it's, it's the only place they know in Canada, so it'll be fine. That's true. That's true. Finally use that to our advantage. That's right. Uh, let's, <laughs> that is all the pandemic I want to talk about this week. So uh, we're tired of it. Yes. Now, uh, today, uh, we don't have the details yet. Um, in fact, I've lost track of when specifically they're announcing this today. The, the details, rather. But apparently, um, Jordan... Miracles do happen. Apparently, uh, ICBC is going to give drivers rebate, rebates for driving and more to the point, crashing, much less during the pandemic. Um, we don't know how much that is or practically, and so we're kind of handicapped here. We can't talk about details. But that's kind of the point in that, you know, if you read Rob Shaw's piece, I want to say last week, uh, we don't know what's going on at ICBC. They have declined to share their financials for a little while now. So, you know, we don't know if we're getting a good deal or, or if, you know, it could be much better. It's, you know, I, we're still talking about hypotheticals. And by the time some of you are watching and listening to this, the details will be out there. But that said, at a certain point, ICBC is going to have to give everyone a look under the hood. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about the rebate first. Yes. Welcome to the parade. You're at the very end of it, ICBC. <laughs> Every other auto insurer in Canada has given their folks, including the public ones, have given their folks rebates uh, previous to this. Every single private auto insurer in North America has given some kind of rebate. The reason why? There were shutdowns, the pandemic, people drove less, offices were closed, there were less crashes, um, and also less claims to be paid out. You know, no one could go to yeah. get you know emergency surgery. Well, you get emergency surgery, but no one was getting certain um, health uh, physiotherapy, for example. So. Yeah. You know, insurance companies suddenly had this pot of money materialize. They were still collecting premiums at full rate, but every other one gave that, some of that money back. Not ICBC. No, no. God forbid the government-run uh, insurance agency actually do something positive for the people who pay its bills. And they sat on it. We are now February 2nd. Um, we are a year since the first case came in. We are, you know, the lockdown happened March 17th, so we are 10 and a half months since the lockdown began. Um, and certainly eight, nine, uh, eight or nine months since we really knew that, you know, there weren't as many crashes. Um, and now, just now, they're finally giving money. The, the irony is there will be some of these drivers will probably get that money before they get their actual, you know, fake $1,000 check from uh, John Horgan. It's not really $1,000. <laughs> that was promised before Christmas, but that is, I guess, standard procedure. Group health insurance companies, they also gave rebates to companies, to employers. Um, like every other insurance company did this, but for some reason, uh, ICBC just dragged their heels, dragged their heels, dragged their heels. And I bet now they've realized uh, you know, the bottom line is exceedingly healthy. And so they better get this money out the door or we'll all riot. I mean, you're right. I think we ran, the Orca ran a couple pieces, uh, at least raising this idea, I, I want to say last summer. I mean, it was. Yeah. And, and and not in they weren't accusatory pieces, you know, like ICBC is terrible. It was just, hey, people are driving less. It seems obvious when people are feeling the crunch that you would, as a public insurer, part of your mandate is to, you know, not not squeeze people. And uh, it, it it's a shame that it took this long. And because we don't know what's going on behind the scenes in terms of finances, it's, you know, we we don't know the reasons why. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a here's one idea. What if this has more to do with the transfer of ICBC from Dave Eby's control to Mike Farnworth's control? Eby versus Farney. And Farney, I think we most would agree, um, like Eby, Farney is definitely the more retail politician. Like, you know, lives in the suburbs, uh, you know, was a city councilor, like, you mm -hmm. know, had connect, you know, some more connections into the community. Dave Eby, lawyer, civil liberties, wrote a protest manual. Um, like, it's not, it doesn't really jive with, like, the vast majority of British Columbians. Like, you wouldn't be looking at that resume going, oh, I identify with Mr., you know, protest manual writing, um, Sam Cooper's best friend, apparently, uh, Dave Eby. 
Um, I'm just saying. I'm just, just like saying. By the way, one little thing on money laundering. I feel like I'm following two separate commissions. One being reported by Ian Wall, oh, yeah. the Sun, and one being reported by Sam Cooper at Global. And I have no idea what is the correct version. Um, so, uh, anyways, it, it, it is. You're, I mean, you're absolutely right on that quick point. Is that I have? I, I know we're not alone to, to make this comment. Is that you read Mulgrew's pieces and Sam Cooper's pieces, and it's like they're completely different beats. They're, they often have nothing to do with each other. It's amazing. And as someone who lives in Victoria and obviously isn't in the commission, it is very difficult to know what's yeah. actually happening there. I've I've no sense as to how this is going to go. Um, some people listening would say I just have no sense. But you know, I've, <laughs> I've no sense of where that's going. Anyways, I do wonder if the ICBC, if Farney a little bit more, a little less married to the file, new eyes, looked at it and saw this kind of burgeoning bottom line was and said, you know, guys, we have to rebate some of this. Um, yeah. You know, if we're going to get people to buy into no fault and to um, all these different things. By the way, the new ads for ICBC are just. Um, oh, I haven't seen them. Oh, you know, it's such a waste of money because it's a monopoly. You don't have to advertise. Just send us the rate changes. Like you don't have to warm and fuzzy it up. And the, the thing that's really offensive is, you know, it's a couple and they're talking about, you know, ICBC and they don't really care because it's insurance. And, and I find that kind of funny. But, you know, they talk about, um, well, our rates are going to go down. Oh, and we're going to get more, uh, more protections. You're not getting more protections. The whole point of no fault is you're actually getting less protections. If you're getting more protection, it would cost more. You know, you don't get more for less. So, you know, if I were the trial lawyers, which I'm not, and I just uh, said Evie's out of touch, but, you know, now I'm going to talk about trial lawyers, they should be all <laughs> over. Uh, they should be all over this. Like, you're not getting more for less. If you're a young person who's injured in a car accident, you will get a, you know, set amount of money for life for your care that has nothing to do with what your potential earnings were, could have been, what your family lost out on, the care you need. It's just going to be uh, like a menu item. You, you are literally being um, widowed, widowed down to a menu item. This kind of accident is this kind of pay. That's it. There's no flexibility whatsoever. So, you know, it's a little bit much for them to be like, oh, we're going to get more for this. You're not going to get more for that. And also, quit spending money monopolies, on, I, government monopolies on advertising. It's ridiculous. Do you ever get any uh, brand confusion with the ICBA and ICBC? Uh, <laughs> yes, from time to time. Yes, yes. And uh, generally, people. Uh, like my uh, email address, Jordan at ICBA.ca. Did you say ICBC? No, 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 I didn't. Okay, thank God. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, you know what? I had said earlier that I don't want to talk anymore of the pandemic, and I still kind of don't. But you and I had oh. talked earlier about maybe talking about you know, Bonnie Henry yesterday saying uh, Super Bowl parties. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like we should because it's going to be news. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's depressing. <laughs> depressing and you know I, I, I I'm uh, unhappy about this uh, Super Bowl party because the Green Bay Packers aren't in the Super Bowl therefore I will be boy no um, <laughs> we have a tradition in our house I make Super Bowl nachos we never mm -hmm. have people over because I'm terrible to watch football with especially if my team's in um, and if my team's not in then I'm grieving so uh, but the kids know uh, they already know Super Bowl nachos for supper uh, there's no judgment you have as many nachos as you want uh, I'll make the fresh pico de gallo in the morning. It'll be great. Um, but that will be the only Super Bowl party. Look, for businesses, for restaurants, um, I think the point is fair. Like, Dr. Bonnie, tell us today, tell us yesterday, tell us last week yeah. that it's not going to, you're not going to allow it. Don't pull the rug out from under us again like you did New Year's Eve. And apparently, that's what they're going to do. They're going to wait till Friday the 5th for a Sunday game to tell, you know, restaurants that the restrictions can or will continue. She's already made the decision. Like, nothing's going to happen in the next two days that are going to have her lighten up for the Super Bowl. So, you know, you might as well just come out and tell the truth. Well, and the frustrating thing is you see people reacting, saying, well, it's no big deal. If you had plans, just cancel them. Well, I mean, Kate, that's one thing. We've been, people have been told that for months. But the point is more, more for the businesses. If, if you've ordered extra chicken wings, for example, mm -hmm. th you've already done that. Like, yeah. that's happened. That's money that's spent. It's out the door. Uh, and chicken wings are actually a great example because those things are pretty perishable. They don't last forever. Mm -hmm. And so it, there are real consequences to doing things too late. I mean, this is not to suggest, well, whatever, we don't want to waste money on chicken wings, so let everything open up for Super Bowl. That's not what I'm saying. Is that yeah. the, the situation has not perceptibly changed for weeks now. 
with COVID. I mean, yes, the curve has flattened, but it's not like we're anywhere near where we were in the summer. This should not be a surprise. They should not be getting caught off guard by Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, and just like they should, there was no excuse to be caught off guard by New Year's Eve. I mean, that yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, well, look, she yeah, should well, already, we should already know what the regulations are going to be for Super Bowl Sunday. She should be announcing, you know, yesterday what the regulations are going to be for Valentine's Day. And, you know, she should be announcing as well, you know, if there's any changes for Family Day. Like, mm. give people a couple weeks notice. You've already said the next two weeks are so pivotal. They're so important. They're so vital. These next two weeks, this is a yeah. you know two weeks to get the curve down, which by the way is down. But whatever, just come out and tell folks. Tell these restaurateurs who have already been put through the ringer. Hey, you know something like ten thousand restaurants have gone out of business already in Canada. There's gonna be hundreds more. You know, like it's it's just so unfair and short-sighted, and it shows yeah. that she hasn't learned the lesson from New Year's Eve. Yeah. And I mean, and this is not the main point, but I do get very tired of being told or hearing people say to others over and over again, well, who cares? It's no big deal. Just cancel your plans. Ah, you can't tell people how to feel about things. Everyone has their own specific rituals and, and things that they treasure. Um, I'm bringing up Super Bowl Sunday because I watch it with my dad every year. Um, I once caught, just a couple of years ago, I caught a red eye from Calgary immediately after a wedding reception. And um, it, yeah, I was, it, I was very tired the next day, but I did it so I could watch the Super Bowl with my dad because we don't, we don't miss it. Yeah. And obviously we watched it together last year. We're not going to watch it together this weekend. And like, yeah, he's he's bummed about it. And I am too. And we're still not going to do it, but it, it makes it sting even more. And people are like, well, what's the big deal? Yeah. Just yeah. like, just Zoom. Well, why, why are you watching the game? That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Just because it's not important to you doesn't mean it's not important to other people. Exactly. And just because you don't give a shit about chicken wings doesn't mean those restaurateurs who've spent hundreds of th or thousands of dollars to buy them and now we're going to watch them spoil. Uh, it, it doesn't matter to them. And look, people could go to... My wife and I, we went out last week to uh, the Fort Pub. Had a great night. Mm -hmm. Just the two of us in our little bubble, in our little space. We were all fine. There was music bingo going on. I'm terrible at it, but she loves it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, like, it was great. It felt normal adjace, <laughs> Like, normal-esque. <laughs> normal normal-esque. Like, I like that. And... You know, I think Super Bowl Sunday is a chance, you know, would have been a chance to like, okay, you know, can we find some semblance of normality to help folks through what's been a grim, grim January. Like, I, that January was, you know, it was 31 days and eight years long. Like, it, it was <laughs> awful. It was awful. Yeah. And, um, you know, now we have, you know, February is interesting, right? You've got Super Bowl Sunday the 7th, you got Valentine's the 14th, you got Family Day the 15th. Like, you can... That, that's important times for mental health, important times for relationships. Um, and instead we're just kind of, you know, frittering it away again, and here we go, so. Yeah, no, it's, tr it's true. It's just, I would like to see more empathy on the part of, you know, the ordinary people who are, you know, yeah. playing by the rules and, and doing everything they should. And that's one thing that I just don't see in commentary and online, and it's frustrating. Um, we should wrap up which, with, with what has become a weekly segment um, uh, it's Jordan Bateman profit as <laughs> Jordan <laughs> gives us updates and what's happening behind the scenes and news in the still not yet official BC liberal leadership race. Well, McLean, when you're the last prominent BC liberal left in, uh, <laughs> online, you've cornered, you, you've cornered the market, cornered the market. My, I believe my, uh, my points, uh, I believe it's a hundred points per riding my point. I, I'm worth 8,700 points. So anyone who gets me will just automatically uh, win. Um, uh, remind me, I do want to talk about pipeline. So after be civil. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. So we here's who we know who's in. Um, you know, been talking to some folks in and around different campaigns. Falcon's definitely in. Ellis Ross is definitely in. Um, Mike Lee is definitely in. Um, Gavin Dew is definitely in. So you got those four. Aaron Gunn. There is a draft Aaron Gunn website, which was the cause of much mirth online. Um, I would say this: underestimate Aaron Gunn at your own peril. Um, Aaron has a very dedicated social media following. We've never seen a leadership campaign uh, begin with the kind of social media following that he has. Um, so we have no idea if that can be actually converted into $10 or whatever the cost is memberships for the BC Liberal Party, but it could be. And if it is, um, you know, that could be very, uh, that could be a very potent thing to try to overcome. So Aaron Gunn, um, 
I did, I did have a chat with Aaron, who I know from uh, old Canadian Taxpayers Federation days. He uh, ran the a university uh, campus club initiative of the uh, Canadian Taxpayers Federation called Generation Screwed. Built it you know, school by school from scratch, did an excellent job, um, and now that has been handed over to the uh, to, to students at each of those different universities. But I talked to Aaron, and he's, he said to me, he said, look, I'm legitimately torn. Right? There's some folks who think I would be a good candidate, who you know think I should run? They kind of put this website up. Um, he's like, I, I didn't discourage them, but I didn't encourage them. Um, you know, I, I get the sense that Aaron really likes kind of the little social media encla enclave that he's kind of carved out for himself, the little niche. Um, he loves the. Uh, he did a recent video series, I guess, um, including one on uh, resource projects, and got to travel BC a little bit and talk to some folks um, on those. He really likes doing that kind of thing. Obviously, being the leader of a political party or in a leadership campaign would take away that a lot of that ability to do it. But um, that's where Aaron got his at. So I, I, I still put him on kind of in the, you know, hasn't made up his mind, even though there's much mirth and, and speculation on Twitter that if you have a draft Aaron Gunn website, that obviously it's Aaron Gunn wanting to draft Aaron Gunn. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about, about that. The other name that keeps kind of floating out there is Renee Merrifield from Kelowna. Mm -hmm. And, you know... Um, like it's tough for a new candidate like Renee, who has you know, been in MLA for just mere weeks, um, does not have huge deep roots within the party uh, as a whole. Um, you almost need someone, and I forget his name, but there was a campaign manager who signed on with Leslin Lewis um, and kind of you know, professionalized the campaign structure and ran it. That's kind of what Renee needs. And you know, if I were a young VC liberal operative looking to make a name for myself, I'd probably drive up to Kelowna, um, or zoom up to Kelowna, whatever, uh, huh. and I would have a conversation with Renee and see if you know I could be that person to run that campaign, because it's all upside, right? Yep. You know, no one expects her to win. So if you finish third, people are like, oh, you know, if she has a good performance on the debate stage, suddenly she could get that Leslie and Lewis momentum, um, and you know, if a lot of people think that if the campaign. Uh, uh, conservative campaign had gone on another month that Leslie Lewis would have won the way she was building steam there at the end. Um, low expectations for her. She could easily meet them. She seems very personable. Everyone we talk to who you know, has interactions with her really likes her, finds her very interesting as a candidate, but I don't think she has that infrastructure to, to build around her. So, you know, if you're out there and you want to make a name for yourself, maybe give uh, Renee Merrifield a call. Free advice for ambitious young, well, not necessarily young, ambitious operatives out there. Yeah, look, like, you know, I, I don't think, you know, I think there's a sense that, oh, Falcon has a race in the bag. And, you know, those who are running against Falcon would say, yeah, I heard that about Peter McKay, you know. <laughs> so I, I heard that about him last time against Christie. Yeah. Um, you know, so there are ways to defeat a front-running candidate. Um, Ross and Lee, by coming into the race, I think have bucked the trend of uh, people bowing out. And, and uh, you know, I think Falcon would have, Falcon's campaign might have preferred there not be a huge race. Like, just let's, everyone prefer to be appointed than, rather than have yeah, to of course. Run, through that hope, run through those hoops. But that's not going to happen. So there is that opportunity. You can either go and join the Falcon campaign and be person 74 <laughs> joining that. Or, you know, you can be person one or two on the Merrifield campaign and go from there. It's an, like, it's an interesting way to, it's an interesting way to kind of make yourself known within the party, to get some experience that maybe you otherwise wouldn't get, and uh, you know, have a candidate who may have the better than you think chance. It's, uh, I mean, it's interesting if, if, um, if nothing else, um, obviously Renee Merrifield would benefit immensely from the fact that, I mean, they just can't have four, four men up there alone and oh. uh, having a, I, I, it should just be almost, I don't want to say a requirement because you can't require things like that, but I mean, it would be just optically so much better. And I say this knowing, you know, almost nothing about Renee Merrifield. I know that she's from Kelowna, as you say, and she's the health critic, but I mean, I just, I, I don't know much about her and I suspect I'm not alone. She is, as you say, a new MLA. Yeah. yeah. Now, look, now look, there's a lot of, a lot um, of uh, garment rending within the uh, party right now about like, oh, where are all the bright young candidates and where's all the exciting... I would point out that John Horgan was the only candidate for his leadership. And Dave Eby bowed out, and Michelle Mungal bowed out, and, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think who else. Mike, Mike Farnworth. Mike Farnworth, yeah. yeah. Farnworth, although only, only Farney would appreciate the irony of him being called young. 
Um, but you know what I mean? Like there was a, there, that generation all kind of disappeared and Horgan just walked into the leadership. He was the, the only candidate. Uh, so let's not get too down BC Liberals. Like, you know, yeah, it, would it be great to have, you know, five young, you know, center right AOC types out there, you know, running uh, for leadership? Sure. Um, but like, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta go with what's, you know, who's actually willing to put their life on hold to put their career on hold and, and to run. Um, yeah, I just, I'm not as like, I don't think it says desperately, um, terrible as, as some folks online have, have suggested simply because again, Horgan was the only candidate yeah. and you know, he's the premier. Oh, and, and he, exactly. And I, I think Horgan would be the first one to tell you that, I mean, things change really fast in politics, but I think even especially in BC politics, as as late as 2016, the NDP viewed the upcoming 20, 2017 election as unwinnable, as yeah. you know they were they were building two elections out, um, and so I mean obviously that's not what happened, and so, yeah you, you never know. Yeah, exactly. You, you never do know. Um, one last thing, it's a pipeline protest season. Yes, and they have returned. Uh, ex- the weirdly named Extinction Agenda uh, group. They shut down the Iron Workers Memorial Bridge here in, uh, in Lower Mainland last week for a bit. Ex- Extinction Rebellion? Uh, I thought it was Extinction Agenda. Oh, is, oh you know really? What? Maybe this too. You know what? I think Extinction Agenda is an old X-Men comic storyline. <laughs> <laughs> That's news to me. <laughs> That's news to me. <laughs> I will take your word for it. Uh... That's... That's it was awesome. the 90s. It was we'll, a crazy we'll time. We'll fix that in post. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies to the Extinction That's Rebellion a... I, uh, <laughs> for getting you confused with Cable's first appearance in the X-Men. All right. This is, I'm slightly mortified by this now. I'm blushing here. It's just... <laughs> I'd, I'd bail you out, but A, I'm enjoying it too much, and I also have no idea. I'm not a comic book guy. I don't, I don't think anyone <laughs> thought I was cool, but now I very clearly... <laughs> Um, confirm that. Anyways, it's uh, protest time. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> pipeline protest time. Extinction Rebellion is back. Um, and uh, I, for one, say uh, just stop it. Like, knock it off. This, these pipelines have been approved um, through a very difficult political process, through very rigorous environmental assessment processes, through multiple court challenges. They've won every single one. Um, you know, they got to yes. We need to stick to yes. We need to build these pipelines. For one thing, I live in Langley near a rail line that you know oil travels on, and it doesn't make sense to me that we're sending oil over rail lines over rivers and, and you know environmentally sensitive areas when we could put it in a pipeline that is safe and secure and modern and has all the uh, the bells and whistles to keep it you know safe and, and out of the ground. Like it's crazy to me that this is the option that these folks would rather have. Um, it's crazy to me that the option for the Keystone Pipeline was a beautiful pipeline that runs safely or, you know, thousands of rail cars traveling down to, yeah. uh, to Galveston. Like, it doesn't make any sense. So, pipeline protest season, uh, je suis fatigué. Um, <laughs> it's enough is enough. Um, these are settled matters. And at some point in democracy, you have to move on from it, right? Like. Even the NDP, every tool in the toolbox, they got their butts kicked in court constantly. Even they have, for the most part, you know, shut up about this. Um, we need it. We need the economic. Uh, we need the jobs. We need the economic prosperity from it. Coastal gasoline is already 25% complete. Like, just let us get on with it and stop yeah. inconveniencing the public with your um, agendas that the public does not support. Well, you're right about the public support has always sort of been consistently in favor of, uh, and we're talking about Trans Mountain here, mm-hmm. uh, not by huge margins, but but supportive. And the other thing is, it's not a ch- it, the choice is often presented by Extinction Rebellion and others as okay, it's either pipelines or we'll get rid of them and everyone will just live on solar and 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 wind and all that. And that, that's not what actually happens in practice. Is it's either pipelines or, as you say, shipping it by rail because people still have gas powered cars and the transition will not be overnight. Nope. Um, no matter how, even with our best efforts, which are actually pretty substantial uh, in North America and British Columbia, but it's, 
if you shut off the oil tomorrow, everything grinds to a halt and a lot of people starve to death. And I mean, that's just, I'm sorry, but that is a basic truth. And so until we get there and we're not there yet, yeah, we still rely on it, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I agree. So just enough, enough. Yes. Like read the room, we're all exhausted. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of patience for protest tactics this year. Like enough is enough. That's right. Jordan's Neil. Jordan's nerves are not made of adamantium. That's right. And he can only take so much. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I can't teleport out of here like Nightcrawler. I can't uh, change the weather like Storm. But uh, it's all. I, I guess I'll be okay. I, I had to reach deep to get any kind of X Men reference. I, I just. I mean, I was racking my brain. I, uh, Hugh Jackman's in it. And I, oh right, adamantium. And that's kind of it for all I know about them. Yeah, adamantium. Also, what Captain America's shield is made of. Fun oh, fact. I didn't know that. So, and I mean, before, unless you people are vibranium? watching and listening, thinking I'm like nerd shaming Jordan, I can tell you the main event of WrestleMania nine off the top of my head, and who hmm. the Broncos' third string quarterback was in 1987. Bret so, Hart no, versus Yokozuna. There's no shaming going on here. Bret <laughs> Hart versus Yokozuna. That I know nothing about. <laughs> was it at WrestleMania nine, Caesar's Palace? Bret Hart, Yokozuna. You are correct, Yoka, sir. I'm impressed. Yoko cheated. Brett got salt, or Mr. Fuji cheated and got salt in Brett's eyes, and then yeah. Hulk Hogan had to come in and win back the title. Our hero. Uh, and Ken Parcher was the Broncos' third string quarterback in 1987, just, yeah, in case anyone cares. And they there don't. You. I know that. No, they don't. Well, this has been a great episode. <laughs> if you made it through the morose, uh, you know, excruciatingly painful uh, breakdown we had at the beginning, congratulations. If you made it through the X Men references, uh, well done, well done. And uh, now you're here at the end. Um, we appreciate it. Really, you could just download it. You don't have to listen. We'd still get like a little point on the thing. But we appreciate you listening and coming all the way to the end of this terrible <laughs> journey with us. <laughs> Never has our tagline been less accurate. That's happy politics. Until next week, he's Jordan Bateman. I'm McLean Kay. And damn it, I'm going to say it anyway. Happy politics. <laughs>